I'm Yvonne Villarreal with the Los Angeles Times. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, between the six of you, you guys have explored sexism, classism, morality, sexual assault, mental illness. Talk about not being afraid to push the boundaries or being topical with your shows. Take it home, Sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know that we're that topical on The Good Place, which is, I think, the show you're referring to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, in fact, uh, the show was explicitly about ethics and morality, but it, it, um, it was designed before the current uh, administration. And as a result, we have a good answer to the question of whether anything about the show is in any way an answer to that administration or its various um, ethical challenges, which is, you know, we... It's impossible, temporally impossible. Um, but it, it has been interesting, I'll say, to be discussing this stuff, discussing like ethics and morality in a time when mm -hmm. the front page of every newspaper, including yours, very frequently has the word ethics in it, <laughs> and not for good reasons, mm -hmm. right? The headlines aren't like, everyone loves ethics. <laughs> uh, so that's been interesting, but, it, but it's, um, it's coincidental. It's not causal, I would say, in terms of the current state of affairs. How did I do? Can you do it again? Really? From the top? Cool. Oh, do I have to go next? Uh, I, I, um, uh, I am a stand-up first, so I think that I just, my brain is very attracted to the things that make people uncomfortable, that make people laugh, that piss people off, that are, you know, I haven't quite figured out what I feel about it. You know, anything that I'm conflicted about is usually something I want to write about. Um, when the idea of Roseanne you know, uh, came across my um, plate, I guess you would call it. I, um, I was attracted to how controversial the show always was and how co controversial the star tends to be. I don't know if you guys heard. Um, but, uh, you know, I disagreed with a lot of the things that I think the show was um, going to maybe explore. And I wanted to get out of my comfort zone because I think I tend to be in an echo chamber of I only follow people on Twitter that agree with me. I only read, you know, articles that agree with me. and. Um, you know, after the election, I, I really was lost in terms of how to make sense of all this. And I just had a compulsion to be in a room with someone that I disagree with and see if we could find common ground or see if we could sort of explore that. So I really just like being uncomfortable and, and maybe making people uncomfortable. It's, it's I had a bad childhood. That's what happens. Um, so yeah, so I don't really think about it consciously. I think sometimes when you put a bunch of, you know, writers together, that automatically happens. We want to go where no one's gone before. Well, and Frankie, I remember going to a screening of the pilot. I think this was at TCA, mm -hmm. and there was like a Q&A after, and there was this one woman who oh, yeah. took a real issue with the fact that uh, Bridget, the character you play, is binge eating, and she's in this sort of space, and her son's asleep, and she makes the decision to make a quick run to the corner store that's mm -hmm. right down the corner. Mm -hmm. um, and she took real issue with that. like. How could a mother do this? Mm -hmm. She was demanding to know if I had done it myself. Mm -hmm. And I didn't give her the pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm not claiming to represent every single mother who has ever lived. It's like this, it's, and you know, to what your question was before, this is a show that takes place in blue collar Boston. There's a Latino baby daddy. And there's like, so we're dealing, and then it's like very female, centered. A lot of the stories are based on the stories that have happened to me or my writers. And so it's not, as you guys were saying, like necessarily, oh, we're going to be this issue show. We're just sort of reflecting the world in which the show takes place. And so there's a lot of, you know, talk about the, and then also like the generational differences when you are in a place where you're struggling financially. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, I mean, my agent actually got into a fight with this journalist on Twitter who was like, I don't want to see it sit like messy single moms. And it's like, well, this isn't, doesn't have to be like, this isn't, this, I'm not representing everyone. And yet by talking about some of the sort of more universal issues, hopefully it reaches, you know, a broader audience. Who's your agent? <laughs> Larry Sauls at UTA. <laughs> I love that he's on Twitter. He was like, what did you say? And yeah, I mean, I, sc I screenshotted all of it. I'll send it to you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, to that, like pushing boundaries, what have been some of the most insane sort of network notes you've been given? And it doesn't have to be with this show, even past shows. 
when they're scared about rocking the boat or how something might be received. Do you guys? I, I'm actually just going to say something about Twitter because I'm not walking anywhere near that question. <laughs> um, you guys can take it. Oh, it is really interesting, though. It was just interesting based on what you were saying about um, about the way in which we get in our echo chambers. Right, this has become such a big conversation, and I had written. Uh, al almost all of our season before the election. Um, so we were in the same place, temporally not possible. And yet the show is very much about uh, wealth disparity anyway. But it's interesting that the ability to engage has been reduced to what is it, 140? I can't even remember. But More it's, now. It's gotten longer, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. It's like it, this is how, this is our it's civic engagement. This is our civic engagement, which never, which because it doesn't happen face to face, creates uh, much more ability to be dismissive of the other, you know, all that other stuff that we've all been talking about. Right. It's really interesting that, that. I think it's inter like interesting to talk about just how a lot of our shows were being written post election or like how that changed our approach. I don't know, for me, it, like, it was like, oh, let's go for it. Mm -hmm. But on the, on the flip side, like the trolls are that much louder. Yes. You know, and you're so, very emboldened. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't have trolls. Well, it's funny. We're well, right. I love it. <laughs> Unless you read my <laughs> Okay, okay. And I'll pretend they're from you. On the Americans, we're, we're in a similar situation in, 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 in that it's temporally impossible. But, but there's something else, too, which is the whole show was designed to not be topical. Yeah. It was designed to take a look at an em enemy that was no longer an enemy and to examine the question, <laughs> of, <laughs> yeah, the question of how could we have possibly, possibly looked at these Life kind people? Uh, as, as From the enemy. beginning, you, you should have just been like, them? your attitude should have been like, yeah, we knew. We knew. <laughs> yeah, you just claimed that you knew it was all gonna unfold this way. Yeah. We're get, I'm getting a lot of pitches that the next show we do should be about world peace because now that'll that would never guess. happen. <laughs> yeah. It's like the secret. But, Just put it out there. Yes. <laughs> but it's been it's been it's actually been irritating uh, to to have all this stuff mm -hmm. happen. Uh, my partner Joe says it's bad for the show. I like to say it's bad for the world too. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's it sucks because you're trying to do something that isn't about that and that's getting people to. Uh, look at identity and look at conflict and look at enemies and look at marriage in a different way and suddenly it's now through the prism of what's happening in the world today and it's no longer universal. Yeah. But look, none of us can control how the audience is going to experience what we do and the good news is now the shows we do are around for a long time. Mm -hmm. So yeah. audiences later will experience them in different ways. Yeah, our show went through a weird thing where we started breaking stories and doing the first season when, uh, with Obama still in office. So there was, and our show has a, obviously an interesting thing where it's talking about things that people of color talk about privately and then putting those things out publicly, right? Think conversations that we have, you know, in our, in our living rooms or with our friends that m most of the audiences, you know, of, of you know, certainly mainstream white audiences don't ever get to be a part of. And then the election happened during our show. So a lot of our show in the beginning is a lot of people of color t wanting to talk about things that don't get heard, right? And talking about the way the world is and the way the slight, like the little like, uh, paper cut racism, as I like to call it, where it's like tiny little indiscretions of things. Mm -hmm. And then the election happened, and then this sort of veil was off, and a lot of white people were like, this is crazy. And it's like <laughs> so funny because the, char like, the white characters on our show are like, this world is crazy. Like the black characters on our show are like, like, hey, like, we've been saying this. So it's been a funny <laughs> switch to see like the characters in our show also. I mean, like we're writing them, obviously, but again, seeing that thing of, oh, yeah, this is the thing that we were talking about season one or now. You like, guys know there's racism out there? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, white people. Come in. Come, come, come over here. <laughs> well, it is interesting because I feel like, I mean, just in comedies, like it used to be how far can we push the envelope? How can we sort of test people? How can we challenge people? How can we make people laugh? But then the election happened, then it was like, oh, there's this new social responsibility mm -hmm. involved where it's like you want to be edgy and you want to explore yes. and you want to push the envelope, but you also don't want to like set a bad example or, you know, reinforce stereotypes or, you know, sort of there's this old, whole new like floor of sort of uh, broken glass that you kind of have to watch. I think too have some meaning behind it. Yeah. And not just like sometimes networks want to have you push stuff with no sort of real meaning behind mm -hmm. it as opposed to like I want my art or I want the writing to actually like if I'm pushing their boundaries like what is it actually saying yeah. you know as opposed to just throwing something out there for shock value. I yeah, think, like too. a gratuitous yeah. edginess mm -hmm. like have it actually matter. How about what's what's something that has most surprised you in becoming a showrunner? Like Frankie, this was your first time, right? And you took a training. I did the WGA training program uh -huh. for six weeks, 
you hear it, you have visiting showrunners come and tell you all the horror stories and you go through like the writer's room, the budget, which happened to coincide perfectly because I didn't know the show was going to go yet. Um, and so literally got the pickup maybe the day before my last class or something like that. So it was, and that ended up working. But also you can't know until you're doing it just because people are telling you like how hard it is or how impossible it is or, you know, here are the tips. Like, yeah, you're just like thrown in there and... Yeah, I mean, for me, it was just like sink or swim. And so, um, yeah, I think this, maybe the most surprising part was like being faced with how, um, like you're faced with like your worst qualities and your best qualities, I feel like. And so you're like, oh, this part of being like uber controlling really works here, but it also maybe doesn't work with the, this personality or something like that. So you're just sort of like constantly having to be a little bit self-aware and figure out the best way to manage, you know, yeah. up here and down there, like, and sort of like, that's like a, been a huge thing for me. I, sorry. No, I was just going to say that, um, Brian Fuller and Michael Green did a podcast in which they called it the stupidest job in the world repeatedly. Mm -hmm. I have another friend who's who's who calls it the worst job in the world. But it is certainly the most like there's a lot of intensity to something, as Michael says, that doesn't involve curing cancer. It's a lot of like real deep panicked mm -hmm. intensity um <laughs> that, that was all i was going to say about oh, I, well. I mean i, I got <laughs> yeah, uh, over a, sweaters you said yeah, yeah. 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 This, this is the third show i've done and i was fired off the first two mm. so this you know i'm i have to say it's an odd job it's a yeah. strange job I'll, yeah i'll just say I, I i learned a lot from working over many years with stephen bochka mm -hmm. whom mm -hmm. today i miss a lot and it was the opposite with stephen there was never panic there was mm -hmm. always a sure hand oh. There was always incredible respect. He protected his writers, mm -hmm. he always had the writers back. And the writer's room was a sacred place. He would start, every time someone new came into the writer's room, he would give a brief speech about how this was like a therapist's office. Nothing ever left. We all trust each other. We all speak in confidence. And then we'd tell personal stories. And he was always efficient and calm. And he knew that he could be a leader and that it was also a team sport. So he found this incredible way of running shows by leading and also finding people who could do things. He essentially created the position in television of the producing director and spent almost no time on set. Mm -hmm. He would say, if I've prepped it properly, it's going to get shot properly. And uh, boy, there was a lot of wisdom there. How about for you guys? Like, in terms of even just how you decide to run the room or run the show? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, for me, I mean, and I actually have worked right. under Mike, who, who hired me. Um, I've, I've worked on three shows where I think I watch really good showrunners. I worked on Girlfriends, where I learned from Mara. Um, on Happy Endings, I learned under Jonathan Groff. And on Brooklyn, I learned a lot of things under Mike. And I think, like, one of the things that I, I always try to take from it is, how do you get the best... Like we're all trying to get to this goal, right? So how do you just try to get the best out of this person's gifts, that person's gifts, and kind of still like shape that into like an actual story and things like that. And I think that if you hire good people, then you've done a lot of the heavy lifting because you can trust them now to do those things. And so for me, one of the things I learned on the Happy Endings was I worked under a showrunner named Josh Bicell who always told me, um, your life is your life, the show is not your life, have a life. And that always resonated with me. I don't always fo follow it great, but I, I always go back to it as a benchmark of like, I think being a showrunner, part of the things is also just being a well-rounded, healthy individual because you're managing so many people, so many circumstances. You're dealing with writers who have their own lives, production people who have their own lives, actors who have their own lives. And so I just think you have to be a, a, a pretty like solid person person that someone would be a healthy showrunner, you know, obviously to do the job. So I think just trying to be a good person and have a healthy life to me is one of the biggest things I've learned is like when I have a healthy life, I'm able to better manage the other things around me um, just in general because my mind is in a different space than when I'm hectic and crazy and doing all those things. So I think for me, that's the biggest thing is just trying to be a well-rounded human being 
to do that job. That's so great as we sit here on a Sunday. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's such a, such amazing, I mean, yeah, it's like art has to imitate life, but if you don't have a life, what are you gonna write about? I remember being in a writer's room and I was, I was doing too many things and someone pitched an idea about like, what if they go to a baby shower? And I was like, nobody goes to baby showers. <laughs> Nobody goes to, and they're like, yeah, they, normal people go to baby showers. And I was like, oh, like, I got to go to more baby showers. Like, I got to, like, people don't actually go to weddings, like, because I just had no life, you know? So I really couldn't chime in on what characters do on the weekends because I had no weekends, you know? So that's, like, a really, really good point. And you have to make sure you're not depleted because whatever your energy is is going to be the energy of everybody else. If you're tired, everybody's tired. If you're angry, everybody's angry, you know? And it takes a while, I think, to realize, like, you have to come in with levity and joy and, and love. Right, and I, like to what you were saying, it's like, um, it's hard, but it's definitely also the most fun. It like, is so fun. Like, it is so fun to actually, what? sorry, go ahead. Don't you don't think so? What? <laughs> I, 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 yeah, uh, keep talking. Well, no, I was, it's just like, I think there's like, um, like uh, if it's working well or what, you know, like what you're saying, it's like, I mean, I've never laughed harder in my entire life than yeah. when we're in the room, yeah. you know? Yeah. I'm it, with you. It's fun. It's joyous. Yeah. I mean, it's hard work. We all work hard. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, boy, when it's working, what are we doing? Yeah. You know, yeah. um, we're not during cancer. We're telling stories. Yeah. We're just telling stories. It's great. Here's what I'll say. And, like, I, you know, I know that it's, I feel like we all probably say in the room 50 times a day, like, we're not curing cancer. Everybody calm down. But with, uh, I remember Michelle Obama did, like, a call to like producers or something. It was like a couple years ago and she was talking about how the metrics were in for how Will and Grace actually affected the outcome of the marriage equality vote because it was putting wow. gay people mm -hmm. in the rooms of people that maybe never met a gay couple before, you know, maybe had, mm -hmm. you know, prejudices around it and it was and she was basically like please put diverse people on your shows, but gay people put, you know, and um and I was sort of like, yeah, we're not curing cancer, but we kind of are subconsciously brainwashing people or yeah. helping heal people or, you know, I had two parents have strokes in the same like the year and I was in ICU a lot and I would like walk around and everybody was in their hospital bed watching, watching television TV, yeah. in the cancer unit. I was like, you know what, maybe we are carrying cancer. Well, it's like that weird thing too that John Oliver just had this thing where it was like, you know, when you're in somebody's home, you're having access to them yep. in a much yes. different yep. way. Yep. Yes. And that yes. cable channel that was like having everybody say the same thing and you're just like, <gasps> oh, you are hugely influential when you're literally sitting in somebody's house to talk to them. You know, it's, it's interesting because we live in this time when everybody's talking about fake news mm -hmm. and how people get manipulated, but there are also, Two versions of what we do. There's there's a version that's just empty and fun, and there's a place for that. But then there's a version that has meaning mm -hmm. and and can can change people and can challenge people, and there's beauty in that too. You actually had a really interesting point about um, having a full life and being positive and creating. There's so many shows now yeah. that the it, it's so competitive to get writers. Mm -hmm. And I think if you don't have, this is not the reason you should be kind and wonderful, <laughs> but you have to create a, one, a great environment or else you're not gonna get the best talent. You're not gonna get the best actors. You're not gonna get the best writers. You know, So I think all these shows have made everyone have to kind of up their game in terms of like a, not a hostile work environment. Right. <laughs> well, Lita, for you, I mean, by being <laughs> yeah. part of this show, little girls seeing your name on, you know, this art, like, well, maybe not little girls, but women. I was going to say, let's hope they are not watching past <laughs> credits. Um, Let me backtrack. Yes. But Ten year old daughter. <laughs> yes, yeah. Please, you know, God, no. You're in a male dominated field and you have this R rated sci fi epic drama on Netflix. You know, talk about the importance of showing that women can do this. Like, we're not, you know, it doesn't have not, to be. Not able? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, but that's the, that is the fun, right? For me, the fun when you when you do get to go on set and watch Renee Elise Goldsberry be the leader of the revolution and be sort of the, the most, uh, to be able to create the, these characters, these female characters who have all this agency and have all this power in, in a very dark and chaotic world, which, you know, it's an, it's an R-rated show. So I, I do think that, I do think that representation exists on a continuum and there needs to be PG and PG 13 and R and and it it has a place as a more kind of um, I mean it's a dystopian story but the idea that our nightmares are just as well explored and by that I mean sort of the nightmares of women and more marginalized people and 
there is a quality to the show that I hope would make women and girls and people who are not traditionally seen as belonging in genre, whatever that means, um, would see it and say, oh, this is accomplishable. Like this, this can be done. But certainly when you've worked in movies and you've, and you've written stuff that is filtered so completely through the director because it has to be and filtered so completely through the studio because it has to be, there is a, a remarkable joy to be able to write something for especially the actors of color who would not be ever given you know these roles in this same way and to just sit there and see it be done and be able to collaborate directly with them about what they do and don't want to say and what they do and don't want to be and, and actually not have it filtered in the way that that um it has to be filtered if you're writing for film mm -hmm. so but i do hope in between the shrieks of horror you know, while people are watching, going, oh my God, I can't believe she did that. We did, um, I know you guys haven't seen it, but we did a... Uh, Don't spoil. Oh, this isn't, this isn't exactly spoilers, exactly. But there's a, there's a clone fight that involves a nude, a nude woman who's like, she's a meth, a Methuselah. They live forever, hundreds and hundreds of years um, through this new technology, and it's divided the rich and the poor even more. And we did this sequence that's probably the most intense sequence in the entire show. It's two women, and they, they, it is an all-out, knockdown, drag-out fight. And it, we did it with a female director, and you see this, this one character who, who is one of the most powerful characters in the show, and she's nude, and she, comes, she gets killed, and she comes back, and she gets killed, and she comes back, and she gets killed, and she comes back. And there's this, this wrath to her. And when we made it, we were talking about, you know, I don't have control over the male gaze. I don't have control over how people take it. But I do have control over what we were saying, which is, watch the f*** out, because it's coming, right? That's this woman is incredibly powerful and the woman standing opposite her is also very powerful and one of them is latina and one of them is asian and they fill the whole screen they are everything and that that very much what the show was about for me was was that representational element i'm gonna shut up now but that's like oh, no. I, mean, I, I i enjoyed doing it i enjoyed doing it but it was very challenging um and i think anything anything with uh anything that's trying to do something different is always going to be hard. Yeah. So, you know. Well, because there's also this new, there's the already what we go through when you make something, you're like, oh, that wasn't good enough, and oh, this could be better, and oh, we should reshoot that. And now there's, you get the added feedback when it comes yes. out mm -hmm. from yes. Twitter and yes. stuff. And whether say, you want it or no, not. I, I know. I, I, I think that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. Do, you act, do you actively go looking for it, though? I, you know what? No. It's interesting. It's like, I never know if it's just because I have, like, self-loathing comedian brain, where it's like, you can be performing for a thousand people, everyone's laughing. If one person's not, that's amplified. Yeah. So I don't, I'm too dysmorphic to know, but you know, it's, you get, there's just so much, especially if you have a show that's, you know, in the zeitgeist, like, you know, you, people are going to have stuff to say and, and, you know, people want to talk I about it. I turned off all notifications on really? Twitter, all like at whatever replies and stuff. And it's the greatest decision I ever made. Really? Yeah. Because now I, I got pretty good at not looking for it, yeah. but sometimes you can't help yourself. And then now I can't, I can't, it's I don't, tricky like no one, except for the people I follow who ostensibly are my friends, so I... <laughs> so people who tweet at you about the show, you don't get those things. People who tweet at me about anything, yeah. And, it's, and it, it's not just the show, like I'll tweet something about the Red Sox and then I'll get like 40 people yelling at me. It's like, I don't need this in my life. Yeah, it's, a, it's it. a tricky and, balance. And, like, and to be fair, like that's what, the, that's what it is. Like, yeah. I, I don't, it's not Twitter's fault. It's yeah. the, the whole point of this stupid thing is that you say stuff and then people say stuff back to you and it, make, it gets you angry. It's talk radio yes. that's just going all the time. And so by engaging in it, it's my fault. I understand that. But uh, at the same time, like I now have figured out a way to use it that where it doesn't infuriate me as much, or like it doesn't make my blood boil as much. I had the to. we I had an experience last year with it, and I was like, I need to figure out how to be better because most of the response, especially from from my community, has been obviously they love the show a lot. Obviously, people can pick it apart, but for the most part, it was fine. We had an episode last year where we talked about one of the characters. You see, the character doesn't use a condom. And we had a couple of episodes, things like that, and it was like, but for the most part, we tried to always be responsible that there are condoms. But this was obviously a scene where, and it was, I remember people were like. 
you, you're being irresponsible. You said black people get this amount of rate of AIDS and you're being irresponsible and you're showing this. And I was like, what's well, a TV show? Like we don't have time to like show them always go get, get the condom, cut it open, put it on. Like you just get, are getting to a point about you know, what the scene's about. And I was like, if you're looking to my show to like say this, and I remember I got into a big debate with people and so much so that like, I realized like other newspaper articles started to pick up that I was, and I was like, I'm doing, I was like, people were like, you're the voice of this. And, and I was like, I'm doing so much for black people behind the curtain, you guys don't even know. <laughs> I'm, I'm tearing down the black community and I want AIDS to get black people. It was just it was crazy. And I was just was like, oh, I need to like chill out. Like well, this is are, like, but I didn't realize but how you're an much artist, that... you're not a, you're not making, you know, public service PSA, announcements. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's weird. I mean, you guys talk about how, you know, fun it is sometimes. I've just had been working on a show where the main character had voted for Donald Trump. So our room was very uh, tense and uh, stressful and a lot of, not a safe space, uh, very triggering. Um, so it was it was very intense and but kind of cathartic, you know, at the same time. But there was um, a really big argument in, in the room if um, Dan Connor from Roseanne, um, there's, you know, undocumented workers that are now sort of taking his jobs because he's in freelance construction. And there was a really big fight of whether he would say illegals. Mm. And he'd said, these illegals are taking our jobs. And I was like, we can't say that. This is wrong. It's racist. Like I was like, so angry. but that's what he would say. So there's this thing of like, he wouldn't say undocumented workers. He would not know that term. He's mm. not PC. You know, there's a kid on the show in a dress. He would not say gender non-conforming. He'd be like, he's gay. <laughs> he doesn't know, like he doesn't know that he's not meeting with Glad at once a week like I have to, what you know? It, can I ask what you thought of the Roxanne Gay article? Um, should we not talk about that? Uh, <laughs> I. Uh, uh, we should talk about yeah, it. Uh, I'm and, interested. And get a coffee after. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can talk about it right Were now. Were you shocked by the numbers that the show received? And then the sort of aftermath of things that have come to light and the sort of essays that it sparked? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, I th yes. I think there's something really valuable about triggering conversation, yeah. not in the trigger sense, but in the yeah. like getting people to talk about yeah. something, getting people to discuss something. And, and I'm just gonna speak purely as a mom. If there's any value in, in getting people to stop throwing things at each other and shouting and actually engage, right? Even dear God, help us all if it's uncomfortable. Oh my God, what if we're not comfortable talking to each other? Um, I think that's valuable. And I, I think probably one of the things that, that worries me the most is the idea that censorship is in some way virtuous. Censorship is never virtuous. Censorship is just censorship. Yeah. And anytime you start deciding that that what someone has to say should be determined by some other group, whether or not this is an okay thing to say, um, it's art, yeah. and if it can't, if it can't say whatever it needs to say, and if people can't, God help us, learn how to talk about it without deciding to try and fire someone or try and and I, again, I'm, and I'm I am removing from this the idea, news is not fiction. Okay, broadcast new, any kind of news. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like fictional creations. If you stand up somewhere and say something that's blatantly false, and you are meant to be telling the truth, that's different. But um, I can't see anything bad about getting people out of their comfort zone and into having conversations that don't involve sitting at the Thanksgiving table I think it's throwing about turkey at each other. Normalizing violent behavior. And so that's the debate, right? So it's like if you are normalizing certain behavior that might lead to the um, devaluing of human life, yeah. then that's the question that we all have to you know answer when we are creating and if we can justify it as like oh this is one character and we're showing this everything else around it um but if we are sort of like just saying and i i honestly like don't know exactly where i stand on it yeah. um but i think that's like conversation is great yeah we all want we want to be exposed to everything everyone should feel represented and each niche show and you know all that but it's like we're also dealing with like a bigger thing here that where a lot of people are losing their lives and well and, and that's no i'm in this i certainly am in the crosshairs of that because i mean i'm a huge advocate sorry i just touched the mic i'm a huge advocate for gun control sensible gun laws and i make 
shows and movies that involve gun violence. And, you know, I can point to all the statistics between here and, for example, Canada, where we shot, which was so nice in Canada. It was amazing what you have to go through. Could you get guns? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's impossible and you to... have to be licensed. Yeah, yeah. And you have to be registered. And you have to have, um, I mean, it is, I grew up in gun culture. I grew up in Central Florida. And I, I, I feel like, and I feel super strongly that you can make all those arguments about how something is morally reprehensible and that slope is so dangerous. Is it morally reprehensible to empathetically portray someone who, who voted for somebody who, in, in my opinion, is supremely unqualified yeah. to be where he is and could be the author of a great deal of violence? Which is, which is the only, the, the reason that I was, I think, wanted to do this job is like the people that, a lot of the people that voted for him didn't know like they were lied to and they you know so it's like i kind of wanted to dig they in they were lied to and they I, believed they it they were lied to it so and they that's, believed that's it that's why conversation to me is so important totally and i they couldn't wrap my head around why anyone would make that choice like i couldn't understand and i think for me i try to do a job or write a joke or whatever i'm going to do to try to answer a question that i don't know the answer for and you know we did like focus groups and we had you know we literally went out and we interviewed these people outside of cleveland and asked these moms do you feed your kids organic? And they were like, what are you talking about? Mm. How could I afford that? Even I, if I it wanted didn't, to. They like laughed in our faces, and you I know? Would... So I was like, this is just an area I don't know that much about. I grew up around that, but like I've disconnected to it and I'm just, it's interesting and an uncomfortable. And that's usually just where I try to gravitate. I, I'd never make an argument, and I'll shut up. I, I would never make an argument for the, for the morality of like where I grew up. People, people got upset about, um, gosh, what's the Candace Bergen show where she was a single mom, Murphy dear Brown, God, help Brown, us, Murphy Brown. Brown. People, would, people would be furious, right, where I grew up about a show about a single mom, God help us with a mixed race child. Oh I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean at, the, at our focus group, you know, we, you go to the valley and you watch them turn the dials yeah. and then they, you watch them talk and the women were like, oh, it's so nice to feel represented and yeah. oh, our, you know, our sexuality or like um, a lot of like, what's so amazing about Twitter is our show uh, really deals with sexual assault and incest, right? That's like, and yeah, and the fallout and, and the, um, and so there was like this feeling of being seen, which was which is so, this is why I love reading Twitter because you're like, you get, you get that feedback. But the men were so funny, um, they were like, is she desperate or is she a slut? Like that was <laughs> the question. They're just like, that's I love it, that right? Those there. are different yeah. things. I think that's the same. And, and the only two choices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty binary. Desperate slut. But that's also why to make them, you know, I mean, they'd only seen the pilot, you know? So, um, I mean, just dealing with the sort of backlash, like you're saying. I mean, I, lo I love that aspect of it. But to your point, I have to say, like, and this goes back to the Will and Grace thing, right? If Will and Grace did wonders for the pro-gay marriage movement by bringing this different viewpoint into people's houses, like the tricky thing becomes, as you were saying, like perhaps a character, a, a, a person who is an actor on your show believes that there's a, that lizard people are running a child pedophilia ring out of a pizza restaurant, and then a person goes into that pizza restaurant with a gun. Right. Okay, well now it's not like, it's no longer, I only know this from doing all this research into philosophy, which is a subject I knew nothing about before I started this show, but in a lot of social contract theory, where philosophers sit around and they try to dream up how societies should exist, they use these terms that are very interesting, and it's some version of the term reasonable people. Like, mm -hmm. what they say is like, okay, well, reasonable people can agree on X or Y or Z, or if this is a, the way that this should work is that a rule cannot be um, uh, vetoed by any person who is a reasonable person. And they never really define usually what reasonable people are. But that's, to me, that's, that's where the, the discussion about like the art and the artist kind of breaks down a little bit because when, when you, wanna, you wanna believe it as a society, certain things are settled, right? That we've settled certain arguments. Like, for example, you are not allowed to stand up and say that that uh, only white people should be allowed to like vote or own property because black people are are a inferior race. Well, we ought to consider that, right? To just right. kill black people, or if you, whatever. You yes, you ought to, We ought to, We we ought to consider that a settled issue. And the problem is, is that in the last couple of years, 
guess who's back? The people who say that, right? And so now suddenly it's like, wait, I thought we settled this. I thought, I thought that as a society, as a reasonable society, we had sliced off the extreme fringe of violent, racist, reductive, absurd attitudes. And now, sadly, it feels like with this, they're, they're like, let's have this debate again. Should the KKK be allowed in, in the tent, the right? Even the was like Nazis. I thought, yeah. you, like, you actually, right, exactly. Like, wait, about, like, oh, look, the Nazis about, are back. Yes, That's yes, fun. Yes, this is, so funny. Let's get the Nazis know, back in. It's been Florida. repackaged. They're the alt yeah. right now. So, so, right. She grew up in so Florida, funny. lived in Germany. I never thought either of those things was gone. Right. So, like, so, no, like, so this I, is, I knew they were still there. This is, the, this is the problem, I think, with what's happening right now. And it's not, I don't want to only pick on your show or the show you're working on. I, it, but the, the, the problem becomes, like, at some level, what movies and TV shows should be doing is having an ongoing debate about what our society should be like, what we want it to be like, who's... What, what are the rules? What are the, the premises that we all kind of share? And when things that we thought were settled are suddenly no longer settled, and these are things that are hundreds of years old and hundreds of years out of date, and suddenly it feels like it's all creeping back in, it's like, well, God damn it, now we gotta start over. And, and that's when it starts to feel like, you know, Philip Roth wrote a book a while ago about, um, about what would have happened if Charles Lindbergh had become president. And it was sort of the speculative fiction. And, and it was like, uh, you read at the time I read it and I was like well yeah this is scary but thank goodness this will never happen he was a Nazi sympathizer and a bad dude and what would have what what if we had just ignored those problems and now like that speculative fiction doesn't feel speculative anymore and now it feels like we are waging a daily battle for the soul of the country and in terms of like who who is safe and who's not safe and who's protected and who's not protected and what are who are the people that we're allowing into the tent to decide the rules of the society and so that's when something as, you know, usually marginal or sort of ancillary as like a TV show, suddenly that really starts to matter. That's no longer like, that's great that Will and Grace made advancements for the pro-gay marriage movement. That's wonderful. It's now like, well, what are we talking about on a, a fundamental level? What are we talking about, about who we are as a people? And that's where it starts to get real scary to me. Have you ever wondered, I'm sorry, you can stop us if at some point you don't want us to be having a like conversation that maybe is not what you had. <laughs> Comedy. Do you, do, you, yeah. do you ever wonder, because I, I wonder this a lot, again, based on coming from where I come from, where, where um, a lot of the people I grew up with were very active sportsmen and hunters and, um, and the gun debate is very loaded, right? And also where I grew up, very bad, very bad things happened a lot to people who aren't white, a lot. Um, and I, do you ever wonder, this spotlight that turns on us almost immediately, um, where even my goddaughter was saying to me, well, you know, I really worry about the boys who play video games. And I'm like, honey, you can go buy a gun and you're 11, right? You walked in and bought a gun and, at, a, at a show and you're 11. So I, I don't, I feel like conversations about Facebook and Fox News and things that are presented as truth as opposed to what we do, which we aren't presenting it as truth. You know, we aren't. And yet there's this, this massive industry, huge global industry that is devoted to presenting lies as truth. I, I feel so much more concerned and engaged in that than I do like what's my social responsibility if I present a show in which a man who has lived for hundreds of years gets off on killing women. Yes, it's horrible, and I'm showing violence towards women. I'm also showing what I think will happen if someone gets into a position of power whose idea of a good time is hurting people um, and then can't die and becomes so rich. But I think it's to, to, to what you were saying earlier, and I think even you, is this idea. It's like, what's the, what is the driving force behind the art, right? If there's a, if there's a I'm showing something that's sort of a cautionary tale about this because that's my intent versus my intent behind this joke or this storyline is to hurt or to be mean or to or to dismiss so now the art has like mike saying it's like it now the joke or thing becomes yeah i'm going to go into this pizza place and shoot people because the message behind that was ill intent to begin with but didn't he get more of it from and facebook messages that were reinforcing the idea that 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 place right. existed didn't he go to fox news and, you know, as he said, the intel wasn't 100% on this. The intel wasn't coming from fictional television programs. Yeah. That intel wasn't I mean, coming it's, from Yeah, there. it's tricky because I think that it's like, you know, intent, that's super interesting because my intent in terms of working with Roseanne is like, oh, I think I know what this is going to be. I, I would like a liberal progressive person to be in that room. 
and I guess I'm gonna have to do it, you know? It's like, and then, you know, there's kind of an interesting, and I don't know if anyone else has had to go through this, not you, because you're the star and the writer, but like, you know, you make a show, can you tell the difference between the show star and the mm -hmm. show they make? Yeah. And I think we're at a point where you kind of can't. Yeah. Um, we're at this point where it's like, if mm -hmm. Issa decides she yeah. wants to do something, it affects She's the always Right, mm -hmm. totally, you know, so it's just sort of this like, okay, I'm signing up to do the fic this fictional part and to pull auras here, but then there is sort of the... It's just asking so much of audiences because the show, yeah. in this case, is named after her yeah. and it's based, it's it was impossible. originally based on her stand-up, yeah. which was based on her real life, like, no. and then she goes on Twitter and says with all the stuff she says, and it's like, well, you can, if you're her, I'm talking not to you, but to her, it's mm -hmm. like you can pretend or you can claim that there's a line of delineation somewhere yeah. okay yeah. I, I believe you yeah. because I, uh, I'm sympathetic to that argument but you're sure not making it easy to believe that like yeah. I mean yeah and I, I get I was very fascinated about like what happens how does a famously progressive yeah. person yes. get here like what was who the made journey? a reputation mm -hmm. what for was the being the voice for progressive working now? class? I, I, yes, mm -hmm. I do understand it now. And I think that of all the stuff that I was reading, you know, um, there was this great article in the Atlantic of, you know, Hillary, we all thought she was gonna win. It was like a no brainer. The polls yes. were in mm -hmm. yes. and the metrics were off because the polling companies didn't call homes that only had home phones. Yeah, they didn't call landlines. They didn't call landlines. Yeah. And I was like, there is this whole part of the population yes. that is not being seen, not being heard, that we are not talking about, talking yep. to. We're dismissing them as idiot, deplorable, you know, hillbilly morons. And this is how they're... And I am related to a lot of them. Being me too. They are being uh, visible. They're, they're making ignored. themselves visible by voting like yep. this. And yep. is there a way to make them feel seen so they stop voting they feel so ignored and enraged. So will this help? I don't know. Will it help? Will it hurt? Who knows? If Michelle Obama has another conference call, I'm sure she'll tell me. Um, but uh, it was sort of, I think, you know, Wanda Sykes is on the show and Norm Macdonald and, and Morgan Murphy and, and I have a lot of comedians. Um, and we were like, maybe this is a way to make these people feel seen so they're not feeling maligned and alienated and feeling the need to you know, raise their voice in, in ways that are super destructive can, to the world. I can argue it both ways, but I, I will say that I just always want to take the spotlight because that's the, the inevitable feeling of, of art can hold up a mirror and art can, can do a lot of things. But when we're not like taking the spotlight and saying, how, how do people who are mentally unfit get hold of firearms? Yes. And that, that, you know, I, how do our yeah. children not have the educations they need so that they can make informed decisions about what they believe and they don't? Yeah. Like, I just want to say, I believe the question that started this conversation <laughs> was, what's the worst network note you've ever seen? <laughs> <laughs> I totally derailed it because I was like, I don't want to answer that question. I totally don't want to answer that. Poor Yvonne. Like, She's like, like just, yeah, tell us some funny really stories lost from them. your yes. time in the room. Yes. They, the network does say no Nazis a lot. To my I, I hear that, no Nazis. What's like a fun prank that you someone pulled on the set? I got encouraged to do more Nazis. We did a tattoo on our guy's more I, I can help you if you need. He, he was great, actually. Oh, man, we really um, derailed it. Yeah, we were, yeah. <laughs> and they brought comedy to make it funny. And yes, we're always a good the discussion. So here's what we want, guys. Just come to the LA Times building. Yeah. It'll be six, just show it. Just talk about like just what building be over yeah. there. Yeah, Funny stuff. Before we came out, we're laughing. All right, to circle back to the network note, not quite. But it, I guess, <laughs> ultimately, <laughs> we're, you know, in answer to all of this, I think we're not here to change the world. At least not, that's not our primary job. Our primary job is to be interesting and to be truthful. And I think you're right, ultimately, it's also to have the honest conversations. And where we, where we repress ourselves, I think we're in dangerous waters as writers because it's just less interesting when we repress the yeah, truth, sure. I think. And we're in more dangerous waters as human beings because ultimately we are human beings. We're going we're gonna to have disagreements. We're not wired to agree. We're actually wired to disagree. We're wired for conflict. Yes. So once we, once we have conflict, we've got two choices. We can fight it out with sticks and stones and bare knuckles mm -hmm. or we can talk. That's it. There's only two routes. And we are and wired to believe our point of view more strongly if someone hourly agrees with us without empathizing first. Outrage drives you know? clicks. Yeah. Outrage. So if it's like you're like the sky is blue and I'm like no it's not. You're, uh, well, it is blue. Uh, if you say the sky is green <laughs> and I say no it's not, you're going to believe more strongly that it's green. You know, if unless I empathize with you. I do a lot of studying about how <laughs> FBI gets uh, people to admit murders. It's weirdly torture <laughs> not effective too. <laughs> 
Well, talk about the, the sort of responsibility to the audience in another way. Um, you pulled <laughs> off. <laughs> Segway. <laughs> nice. I'm trying. Uh, you pulled off one of guys. the <laughs> the greatest TV twists yes. in history. Yeah, that was good. All um, and then you know, with season like, which revealed that the good place wasn't in fact the good place. Um, and then talk about your approach in season two of not trying to pull the rug out from under the audience again and then heading into season three, like just trying to keep them wanting to come back but not pulling a fast one on them again. I, I'd like to answer that by discussing the rise of fascism in <laughs> 1928 to 1934. Now to put this That's in some historical place. context. That's that a good place. Good place. Um, <laughs> so the twist at the end of season one was baked into the show from the beginning. It was part of the pitch of the show. Um, it was part of what got Ted Danson to sign on because um, the character is extremely sort of like facile or something for the entire Fascist. season. <laughs> uh, it's a metaphor, you understand? For, um, so uh, so that, was, that was baked in from the beginning and then the, and because we knew about it from um, so early, we were able to, keep, first of all, keep it a secret from a lot of the people. Most of the cast didn't even know, most of the crew didn't know. So the chances of it leaking out were very small. And then as we got later and later and later, we just had a conversation with everyone where we just said like, please don't tell anyone, <laughs> please. Aww. And everyone did a great job and kept it a secret. And also because we knew about it so early, we had a chance as we were talking about it with the, the season, with the writers from the beginning, we had a chance to like look forward and say like, we know this is what's gonna happen. So let's try to figure out what season two could be. So we've been like a sort of a season ahead in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of being able to anticipate what we're going to do and, and how to do it. And we decided uh, pretty early on that because the twist at the end of season one was going to be so sort of world upending, we didn't, we didn't want to try to like outdo ourselves. It feels like sometimes, and this is my first, you know this world a lot better than I do, it feels like sometimes in, you can get... Um, you can sort of get, out, oh, what's the phrase, over your skis? Out of, what is it? <laughs> you can jump the shark. Jump the shark would be maybe a better way to say it by trying to say like, okay, well, it's gotta be bigger and better than mm -hmm. last year, whatever. So, we'd, so we'd, we decided not to try to do that, but instead to try to just let the story kind of unfold in whatever way it naturally unfolded. And we stumbled into a kind of cool twist that was in the same family, but wasn't attempting to kind of like outdo the first one. And so we just kind of let that happen naturally. So it was really like, it's, it, I was very, it was very heartening. A lot of the team of people who, who work on The Good Place worked on Parks and Recreation, the last show I did. And so it was a pretty tight knit group. Um, but it was still very heartening to know that in this world, in this day and age, you could get, you could do a, like with a you know, six month lead time, you could do a, you could pull off a twist like that without having a leak out. Um, and then it was so good. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it does feel like that's just, just the quick thought that is really, really cool that you guys didn't try to recreate it second season, that you just sank into the characters that way. It yeah. never felt like it was sort of structurally reached. That was just brilliant. Thank you. It, it, was a, it, was a, it was absolutely a sort of like, you know, that was the goal, was to say, like, we're not going to just try to keep everybody off balance the whole year again. And also at a certain point, it's like, if you just keep doing nothing but twisty, 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 then people start to like, well, what am I? The twist. Yes. Yeah, it, it, first of all, anticipate it and yeah. start guessing. It's like when people go to M. Night Shyamalan movies, they're like yeah. trying to guess the. We did a thing when, um, when uh, what's the one about the magic uh, trees that were killing people? The Happening. The Happening. We tried to guess, we, we watched that in the whatever writer's room I was in, and we would just watch the trailer and then we wrote down what we thought the twist was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was The Village, because oh, it was yeah, The Village. Yeah, the and, uh, and I was like, 55% right. Mm -hmm. When I saw it in the theater, when, if I'm spoiling it, then it's your fault. Yeah, um, but when her foot hit the pavement, everyone in the theater went, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that's fucking cool. That is the problem. So yeah. we, yeah, we, we were like, this is, this show ultimately is going to work or not work based on how well the characters develop. It's not going to become and, a drinking game. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. How about knowing you're in this you're, you're here because your show's about to end. Talk about what? knowing. What? Oh, no. <laughs> she just show. <laughs> A terrible way to find out. <laughs> Talk about knowing when it's time to wrap things up. I mean, like, you can speak to this too, but knowing when it's time. Well, uh, we've had a very supportive network in FX from the beginning. Mm 
they picked us up early in uh, season one. They always picked us up early going forward. And Joe Weisberg, my partner on the show, and I talked from early days about what the end was. And I think we were towards the end of season three, beginning of season two, when John Larengraf came to us and said, how many seasons do you think you need to tell the story? Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe and I took a long walk, uh, I think at the beginning of season four, and sort of pitched out two versions. It was pretty clear to us that it was going to be six seasons. We tried a version that was five for a day, and it just didn't, it, there just wasn't enough room. Uh, so we were able to write to that from early on, and that was really liberating to us. Wow. That's cool. I've never <laughs> heard it, literally, like, <laughs> in network TV, you just write the finale right. for every season, <laughs> yes. because you... At the end of every episode, people go, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm to FX. Yeah. Uh, I want to know, to close things out, what was the show for you, or shows, that made you want to do this? Mm. I'm going to cry. Oh. Hill Street Blues. Hill Street Blues. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm Hill Street Blues. Cry. Hill Street Blues for me. And then to, to find myself working with Steven later, it was, it was a dream come true. It's a, this has been a very tough week. Mm. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, he changed television. Mm -hmm. He just changed the way stories were told. And uh, that was really something. Frankie? Roseanne was pretty what influential. The reboot. <laughs> <laughs> just season ten. Just Roseanne, got in. Just Roseanne made me want to get out of television. <laughs> and then I'm like a huge fan of all these British comedies. So mm. Spaced, Black Adder, um, and then Catastrophe. Like, so good. So good. I love, love, love. Uh, yeah, British humor. So those. That well. wedding ring scene. I know. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cheers for oh, me, great. which is makes my current job so extremely cool. weird. Yeah. Every time my phone rings and it says Ted Danson, I think it's a prank. This week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, so no. so alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cheers. Uh, cheers, number one, and then Monty Python was the other one right. for me. Like I, when I was homesick, I remember being homesick when I was like eight or nine and they used to show them on PBS at like 11.30 in the morning and I stumbled onto it and it, I remember the feeling of like, oh no, I didn't know you could do this. And the first, cool. skit, the first skit I ever saw was the, was the upper class twit of the year, if you know that. It's very long and it's so funny and insane and it, it felt like, I, I felt like I was like having a fever dream. Like I was like, oh, someone made this for me. So that, those two things. The, the silliness of Monty Python and the storytelling of Cheers. Mm. Uh, mine was probably a Larry Sanders show. Mm. Um, that was my favorite show because it, it made me uncomfortable, kind of, and I did, it just it was a feeling I never had. Like um, I loved Roseanne too as well growing up because I loved like there was a domestic violence episode where Jackie got you know, and there was the um, DJ wouldn't kiss the black old girl at the school play. I stutter when I say it. I'm so afraid I'm going to get in trouble um, for saying a storyline that happened 20 years ago. Um, and uh, I just, there was, I, you, it made you laugh and cry, you know, and I always sort of love that sort of bipolar experience. Um, and then more recently, the comeback. Um, I really just loved how that show could make you like hate the character and then you love the character and then you're rooting for the character and then you're yell. It's like watching a horror movie, really. It's like really complicated experience. Um, I wrote on that show, did you know that? What? Mm. <laughs> really? Yeah, first season. Really? Mm -hmm. I think it's the best. Mike Shore. I think I'm a big fan. Thanks, I'm an even bigger fan now. It was great. It I, is my favorite um, season of television. It's anything. one of the greatest. Um, I think it's the greatest. Like show. characterizations I've ever seen. Lisa Kudrow as that character is one of the most like. She was so fluent in that character. Like she could do. She would sit in the writers room all the time. And she would do it. And she would just do be that character. And it wasn't improv. It was script. You guys scripted it very tightly. Yeah, but it came out of a lot of improvisation that she did in the writers room. And she, but it was like you could put her in any situation, and she would just start talking as Valerie. It was amazing. When she um, talks about the rod in her back, I'll cry if I think about it. In the in the finale, yeah. it, it is just it is so it's a true, earned. A true and story of one of the writers. I won't give away who it was for yeah. privacy, but it was me. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> no, it's an amazing, it's a wonderful characterization, and it's it's crazy how the the staying power of that show, mm -hmm. given that it it had, you know, I mean, it was rebooted it's recently, kind of our first but reboot, yeah, but um, that first season is like. Uh, 
it's crazy. You don't, because it's, I mean, most shows is like, the lead has to be likable, and then this is that, it just breaks every rule of like, you love some, you love the villain for a second, like Polly G, you're on, you're on everybody's mm -hmm. side, and you're just mad at everybody at the yeah. same time. It's like having a family, you know, you like, it's love, hate, and I think a lot of times when we get in writer's rooms, you're like, oh, that's not likable, or oh, we can't show this ugly side of a person, you know, it just, I love the, Messy, mm -hmm. you know, as we don't have that discussion on yeah, the right. Americans. <laughs> 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 oh no, we like this character too much. We need to change that. You know, so I think it's just it's just the idea of writing for someone complicated and, and showing all the like ugly, nasty sides and also making them triumphant and victorious is sort of what life is like. You know, right? Yeah. So I, I, I love those. It's a good one, Prentice. Um, uh, for me, there was two. One was uh, Cosby Show, mm -hmm. um, only because to that point I had only seen like shows about people of color where they were poor and this and that. And I grew up like middle class in LA, and my mom was a lawyer like Claire Huxtable, and she was an AKA like Claire Huxtable, and my dad sold real estate, and they went to black colleges. So it was like it was like seeing yourself for the first time represented and being like, oh, like there I am. There are my friends. We get good grades. Like there, there is that life as opposed to being poor and all these other things and talking about art and jazz and painting. It was just like things that I was hearing conversations at my house, and it was like seeing that finally on screen. And I mean, weirdly too, like like Roseanne, and I'll say like. That was the first time I remember watching a sitcom and being like, oh, they're ending an episode on a fight. Yep. And that's the end of the episode. It's like, that's like, also that's how my parents were. So it was also yeah, yeah. like, oh, you can end the sitcom. And like, it was the first time I saw a sitcom be different in that way, mm -hmm. where they would just do, it would be like the whole scene would just be like a giant fight or a weird discussion or you were uncomfortable at the end. And it was like, oh, but sitcom can also do that. Mm -hmm. And that's, I remember just having that reaction to that of being like, oh, I've never seen that before usually it ends in a fun nice way and that wrapped was like yeah wrapped up in a bow and like here's the here's the funny out and it was like no this is just either like dan's cheating or you know mm -hmm. there's a fight about money and that's just like a real argument and i just was like that just really was just like oh wow this can happen do you remember so, the scene in the original roseanne where they go through the bills and how they're going you are this? obsessed with the show you love it's it the best <laughs> roseanne's amazing but that the scene there's a scene where they're they're like they're short on money and they're going through their bills and it's Private. like we, the, we, you mail the water yeah. uh, bill to the, like, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Forget the sign. That, no that I remember because I, I, I grew up like, I would say lower middle class in a very, in a fairly affluent suburb, mm -hmm. but my parents were divorced and my mom was doing that stuff. My mom was like, not quite like mailing the bills to the wrong places, mm -hmm. but the like post dating checks and like all that sort of, all those, all those like survival tricks that you need to learn. And I had that same feeling, across, totally all the way across the country. I had the same feeling watching that show, which was like, oh, there's other people who are like, in that case, I was like, I was the most worst, worse off in the affluent suburb that I was in. <laughs> like, you know, I was like, yeah, I was, yeah. And like, and, uh, and, but I remember thinking like, I, it was important for me to watch that because I was like, oh, I'm nowhere near the bottom. Like I, uh, I'm, I'm like the, uh, at the bottom of my suburb is the, is miles above the a lot of other people in the world, and I didn't. Ohio is like an a, imagination, to, like a f thing for me at that point. But I just, it was very important to like put myself into context. Like I feel like that's what great shows do at some point is they like they help you figure out where you are in that's the world. That's so interesting. You know? I mean, we do. I love that scene as well so much that we um, did it almost two more times this year. One with her and her pills, mm -hmm. trying to figure out, you know, because they don't have health insurance, so they're trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. Okay, this was for you know the guy down the street had his tonsils taken out. And I'm taking it. You know, it's kind of this, the same idea. And then again with points because they're trying to use points on their credit card. It was like, so weird. It's just like has any show done an episode about trying to use your points and it's just like yeah. not as it's yeah. not as on your credit card like we don't even think about that being a story because for us that's so like should I use my points right, but it's right. like for some people that and you can't you and you can't use your points if you haven't paid the bill mm -hmm. on the card so you can't even access it you know so it was just sort of like that's a story on, on a show like this which I just hadn't been able to write those kind of things before so I feel like we need an after show there's so much <laughs> good discussion happening but um, we have to wrap things up Thanks so much for taking the time and being part of this. It was really great having you. Thank you. It's a great talk.